please pray with me. May these words that I speak be grounded in my soul, encouraged by the God presence in me. And may these words that you hear be captured by your soul, enlivened by the God presence in you. Amen. Jesus is not easy to follow. His simple and profoundly compassionate approach to life is a constant challenge for me, and I suspect for many of you as well. Over the past few weeks, I have, been, I have talked about the spirit of Jesus as leader, teacher, healer, and prophet both in terms of how we live, but also in terms of, of how we as individuals and as a community are also called to be leaders and teachers and healers and prophets. This spirit series has been my attempt to make more relevant the role of Jesus in our lives by realizing that he didn't do anything that he didn't expect his followers then to do and us to do today. And I believe that if we are to be Christ in our world today, we need to seek wisdom, to seek wisdom in the spirit of Jesus. Wisdom that is rooted in compassion becomes an experience of God and an alternative way of being in this world that ushers in the kingdom of God. True wisdom is the very essence, I believe, of what Jesus was. And true wisdom becomes our roadmap for the way, the way to God. The trouble is, foolishness too often informs our choices hurting ourselves, each other, and our world. This foolishness is rarely intentional, but more often is the result of how we are socialized, how our culture educates us about the way to live in the world. Individualism, which is worshipped in our culture as the ultimate form of freedom, has dangerously eroded um, social responsibility to care for the other and to care for the planet. Jesus continually challenged the foolishness of this kind of conventional cultural wisdom in favor of a way of living that honored every person and every creature, making each of us responsible not only for our own lives, but for the lives and well-being of the other. In our gospel reading this morning, it is, it is clear that Jesus is disheartened by the incredible lack of wisdom, both in the ruling political and religious elites, and even amongst his own followers. First, the Pharisees, the religious uh, authorities, come and argue with Jesus challenging his authority and demanding a sign, a sign from heaven. Mark says that Jesus sighed deeply within his spirit. Just imagine, I mean, it's such a powerful statement. Jesus sighed deeply within his spirit. You can just imagine his, his uh, just being so disheartened with uh, uh, trying to do his best and people just not getting it. And, and he wonders why this generation needs a sign. For me, just as the feeding of the multitudes was not about a miraculous physical occurrence, neither is Jesus about commanding a sign from God to prove his authority. Rather, Jesus offers a different way, a wise way, for everyone, expecting that recognition of God in him would be realized by the way he lived and taught. And so, 
Jesus, annoyed with their foolishness, says, there won't be any sign, get over it. Well, he didn't exactly say that, but that, but that was the sentiment of it. His frustration was, was really, really evident. There won't be any sign. Then he steps into the boat with his disciples and leaves. And Jesus, likely still smarting from the argument with the religious leaders, tells his friends, watch out. Beware the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. The use of the bread symbol, the use of yeast here by Mark, I, I think is very, very clever. The disciples foolishly think Jesus is upset because they've only brought one loaf of bread for the trip. But none of this is about loaves of bread. It is a reflection back to Jesus feeding the multitudes. It is about feeding souls with bread from God, changing how we understand the world by nourishing ourselves with God's wisdom, God's bread, made known in Jesus. Now, any baker, and there's many amongst you, will tell you that a little yeast is enough to make a whole batch of dough rise. Just a little affects everything. And I think you could translate Jesus' use of the word yeast as attitude. Just a little of the attitude of the Pharisees affects everything and possibly corrupts everything. And yeast was often used as a symbol of, of corruption in the Mediterranean world. The problem with the Pharisees was not that they were big sinners. They were the be often the best of people. But they tended to think that only those like them had any value in the sight of God. The yeast of the Pharisees is narrow-minded religious exclusivism. The yeast of the Pharisees makes people more concerned with who's in and who's out than about getting on with living with compassion. This world. The yeast of Herod, or the Sadducees, is precisely the opposite. Herod and the Sadducees were the ruling political elite and friends, very good friends, of the Roman Empire. For them, the important thing was to keep the status quo, because, of course, it favored them. In order to do so, they were prepared to make any number of accommodations. They were even prepared to water down their faith. For instance, they allowed the Romans to appoint the high priest. That would be like the United Church allowing Stephen Harper to appoint the new moderator, which is going to be chosen in general council when it's coming up. It seriously compromises who we are as a people of faith. They were not committed to God so much as to their own position. The wisdom of Jesus lived out in the stories of feeding the multitudes did not fit with the plans of the Pharisees or Sadducees, where all were included in the kingdom of God. The disciples responding with Jesus is upset because we have no bread, leaves Jesus both disheartened and frustrated. Why are you talking about having no bread, he says? Do you still not perceive and understand? Do you, are, are your hearts hardened? Do you have ears but cannot, cannot hear? Do you have eyes but cannot see? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves? And the seven loaves, do you not yet understand? Good grief. I have that. The wisdom of Jesus has not yet captured their souls. And they remain caught in the foolishness of the world. Will they ever get it? Will we? Ever get it? 
Jesus knew that the way to God, the way of wisdom, was not just about a change of mind. It, it more importantly, importantly requires, and I've said this before, it requires a change of heart. I believe that's why Jesus repeatedly, through all four Gospels, is, is, asks them, are your hearts still hardened? Marcus Borg says it this way, the narrow way, the way less traveled, is the alternative wisdom of Jesus. It is an invitation to see God as gracious and womb-like, rather than as the source and enforcer of the requirements, boundaries, and divisions of conventional wisdom. It is also an invitation to a path that leads away from a life of conventional cultural wisdom to a life that is more and more and more centered in God. For Jesus, the heart, the human heart, represented the self at its deepest level. When the heart is centered in the finite, centered in the culture, it becomes closed and hardened rather than open and receptive. What is needed then is a new heart. An internal transformation brought about by a deep centering in God. There is a third verse to the song that I uh, taught the children this morning, and it says, So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I chose not to include it uh, because I'm uncomfortable always to moralize with children. I think that often happens often enough. But I will say to you that as Christians, we are called to build our house, our lives, on a good foundation. And there is no question for me that Jesus is the foundation that I would choose. However, it is clear to me that with the wisdom of Jesus as the foundation, our house will only become our home, our body will only become our soul, if we are able to open our hearts to that wisdom of compassion. We need to live as Jesus did. It is not about relinquishing our responsibility for our own life, for the welfare of others, and for this planet to Jesus or to God. It is still our life to live. It is still our choices to make. And it is still our heart that needs to seek wisdom in the spirit of Jesus.